In every setting, there are always those conversations that can be very explosive. Like you go to meet your in-laws for the very first time and you sit down. You never want to bring up politics. You never want to bring up death. And you probably don't want to bring up religion. There's just, in every setting, there are just some conversations that always get a little explosive. And the same thing is true with the book of Revelation. As a matter of fact, there are two key questions when it comes to Revelation that I refer to as semantic bombs. Because the moment these questions are asked, something's about ready to explode. The first question is, are we living in the last days? Are we living in the last days? Here's something interesting about this question. Very rarely do people stop and ask the follow-up question. How does the Bible define last days? I mean, you would think if we're talking about the Bible and we're using terms found in the Bible, that we would actually allow the Bible to define its own terms, to tell us its own context. But oftentimes we define last days as the last 24 hour periods right before the rapture, right before the end of everything. But when you look at the Bible, it seems to have a bit different definition. As a matter of fact, last days or last times is only used seven times in the New Testament, only seven times. So what I wanna do is I want us to take a look at a couple of these passages that help us define what last days is so that hopefully it can help answer our question, are we living in the last days? The first passage that is very helpful is Acts chapter two. Acts chapter 2, in case you don't know, that's the coming of the Holy Spirit. That's the birthday of the church. That's where the disciples get up and they begin speaking and all of a sudden tongues of fire descend. They're speaking in other dialects. The people are amazed. And in verse 13, some people aren't amazed. They have a different explanation as to what's happening. They say some, however, made fun of the disciples and said, oh, they've had too much wine. Listen, I, I don't know about you, but if you've ever been in a social setting where somebody's had too much wine, they usually don't get more intelligent. They usually go the opposite way. Their speech doesn't become more clear. It becomes more slurred. But that's their explanation why. Because when you encounter something you don't know, a lot of times you grasp at straws, especially if you think it's gonna threaten or, or you or ask you to be someone different. So Peter gets up, he stands before them all, he raises his voice in verse 14 and he says, fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. This to you. What is the this? This moment. The outpouring of the Spirit. The speaking in tongues. Let me explain this moment to you. He says, listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. In the ancient world, they didn't have 90 proof alcoholic drinks. No, in the ancient world, it was usually four or five to one water to alcohol. He's saying, listen, if, it, if it's nine in the morning, they're already drunk, they would have had to have been really working at it for quite some time. No, he says that that's a ridiculous explanation. No, instead he says, verse 16, no, this, this moment, the outpouring of the spirit is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. This is that which Joel talked about. And then this is what he quotes. He quotes from Joel chapter two and he says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. In what days? Peter says in verse 17, quoting Joel, in the last days. You see, if our definition of last days is gonna match the Bible, on some level, we have to say that last days, the definition of it is connected to the time when the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. Not just in the future, 24 hour periods right before the rapture, but it has to include this moment. As a matter of fact, turn to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter one begins using similar language, begins using language that will help us clarify the definition of last days. It says, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, 
He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, and through whom also He made the universe. Did did you hear that? He said, listen, in times gone by, God has always been trying to speak to us. There's never been a moment in history where God has not been pursuing and wooing back His lost and fallen creation. We have a zealous God that is in desperate pursuit of His people. And in, and in times gone by, He spoke to His people through prophets in tons of different ways. I mean, sometimes they act out, sometimes that they, they speak, uh, sometimes they even call down fire from heaven. Tons of different ways that God was speaking. He says, but in these last days, In these last days, He's spoken to us by His Son. He's spoken to us by His Son in verse 3, who is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of His being. But notice, notice the definition for the Hebrew author. The Hebrew's author is not sitting here saying, the last days, those way down there. No, no, no. The Hebrew's author says, in these last days, Referring on some level to the time in which Jesus lived, when Jesus died, and when Jesus rose from the grave, and then the Spirit came out. He says this equals the last days. You see, our definition of last days pushes it 2,000 years away from the Bible. But the Bible writers consistently, all seven times it's used, they consistently refer to the last days as being present in their time as being present in their life. That the last days began when Jesus was incarnate. And our definition should follow. I I travel around a lot and and I talk about Revelation and usually this is the question I get, Shane, do you think we're living in the last days? And based on the definition I receive in the New Testament, this is my response. Oh yeah, we definitely are. We have been for 2,000 years. We have been for 2,000 years because the Bible defines last days as the time period between Christ's first coming and Christ's second coming. Are we living in the last days? Definitely. But we have been for 2,000 years. Again, go back to the question I asked in session one. Are we going to make the Bible say what we want it to say or are we going to allow it to tell us what it wants to say? If you take the Bible out of context, you can make the Bible say whatever you want. You can redefine even last days. You keep it in context, and it gives you not only its context, but it gives gives you its message of life. Now I want to ask this question. What is prophecy? This is definitely a semantic bomb. What is prophecy? Normally, we say prophecy equals prediction. Somebody says, what is prophecy? Oh, it's a prediction. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, it's definitely a prediction. As a matter of fact, it's funny because it doesn't have to be a Christian that's speaking at this point. You talk to people out to the non-Christians, prophecy equals prediction. You talk to even cults, uh, the David Koresh's of the world, prophecy equals prediction. Here's the problem. The Bible doesn't seem to share that definition. As a matter of fact, if you look up the word prophecy, prophesy and to prophesy, all three of them, Old and New Testament. If you look them all up, and let me tell you, there's a couple of times they're used. If you look up all three words, prophecy, prophesy, and to prophesy, and you look at the context, you will only find a prediction around 17% of the time. Now, let that sink in a moment. That means when prophecy, prophesy, and to prophesy are used, 83% of the time, it is not in the context of prediction, at all. But that's how we define it. We define it as a prediction. Well, if the prophecy is not a prediction, then what is it? This is where it gets a little uncomfortable. You see, prophets only arose when there was a people in rebellion. Prophets in the Old Testament from your Isaiah's or your Daniel's or your Ezekiel's, they came around at a time either right before or during an exile during a time in which the people of God in their rebellion were going to or were experiencing the punishment for that rebellion. And a prophet would arise. You see, prophecy does two things. It prosecutes a rebellious people and it persuades them to change. 
prophecy prosecutes and persuades. It says you are off target and you need to repent. Every prophecy demands a response, which is one of the reasons why Revelation chapter 1, verse 3 would have hit the original audience square in the stomach. Because Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, right at the very beginning of this book, it says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And the moment the people hear that in the churches of Asia Minor, their stomachs would have dropped. Oh boy. Who messed up? That's the question they're asking. Why? Because prophecy, more than a prediction, prophecy is a challenge. Prophecy is a revelation. A revelation of what? That's a fair question. Prophecy is a revelation of three things. Number one, who God is. Who God is. A lot of times people slip into moments of rebellion because they either forget who they are or they forget who He is. Even in times of suffering, even in times where you cannot explain, listen, I'm from Joplin, Missouri, and in 2011, we had an EF5 tornado rip away one third of our city. And in times of suffering like that, you want to know the question we always ask? We always ask the question, why? Why did this happen? Why did God let this happen to us? I mean, why did God take away my son out of the sunroof? Why? Listen, the question why, even though we gravitate towards it, the question why will never satisfy. The answer is, I don't know. But what I can answer is, the answer to the question of who. Who is God? In times of suffering, in times of rebellion, the who is way more important than the why. And prophecy always has the most amazing depictions of who God is. Revelation chapter 1 where you see the cosmic Christ. Revelation chapter 4 with the one on the throne. Revelation 5 with the slain lamb. Revelation 19 with the one coming on the white horse. Revelation is saturated with vivid depictions of who God is. Because when you're a people in rebellion, that's really what you need more than anything is a clear picture of who God is. Revelation or a pro prophecy also reveals what God desires. What He desires. Listen, it's not an accident that the Bible begins in a garden with the tree of life and it ends with a garden and a tree of life. Revelation 21 and 22, the new heavens and the new earth. We see a tree we saw once before in chapter 3, chapter 1 of Genesis. The tree of life. Why? Because God desires to set all of the wrongs right. Prophecy begins with who is God, and it also then moves to what God desires, and then comes the third element. What God demands of His people. You see, as we study the book of Revelation, you're going to hear me saying something over and over and over. Revelation expects the people receiving it to do things to change things, to become someone different. Prophecy definitely reveals who God is and what He desires. But at its very core, in these last days, in between the time of Jesus' first and second coming, the people of God are expected to be doing things to carry out His will, to carry out the good news. Or as Revelation would say, to wear the robes as the bride of Christ because our white fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints.